we are going to speak about the statement of profit and loss consolidated in one go what is going to be the consolidated status of the company what are all the general instruction that you need for the preparation of balance sheet for certain subheadings it is mandatory that you have to give out the narrations good morning and welcome to the unit 2 session 7 in IFRS where we are going to speak about the statement of profit and loss consolidated financial statements now this is going to be a very interesting session why because we are going to understand about the need and importance of the profit and loss and the consolidated statements now moving forward Let's first try to get on to the introduction in what is the statements that are required by the Indian accounting standards. The first one is that the IAS 27, Indian accounting standards 27, which talk about separate financial statements. This is very, very important. Why? Because this tries to talk about the various factors that are involved in terms of the separate financial statement what are the individual statements that you are looking into in terms of your financial statements in terms of your presentation now moving forward the ias 28 which talks about your investments in associates and joint ventures now most of you know about it that Whenever you are looking into a company, especially a multinational company or a larger company altogether, they will have a lot of investments in their associate or joint ventures company. That's because on a strategic mode, they want to invest, they want to gather better value in the long run. So there would be investments by companies in various associates and joint ventures followed by the IFRS 3, the International Financial Reporting Standard 3, which talks about business combination. What are all the factors that you have combined together in terms of reporting? Followed by the IFRS 10, the statement which is going to talk about consolidated financial statements. So in one go, what is going to be the consolidated status of the company so that is what we call about the factors in terms of the uh, consolidated profit and loss statement altogether now moving forward let's first try to understand as per the ministry of corporate affairs company law enactment what are all the general instruction that you need for the preparation of balance sheet in and the statement of profit and loss for a company now the first thing is that where compliance is met with the requirements of the act including accounting standards that are applicable to companies require any change in treatment or disclosure now uh, action amendment substitution or deletion in the headings or in the subheadings so what we are trying to arrive here is that in case if there is going to be any sort of addition deletion or if there is going to be any sort of changes to the subheadings as per the need of the compliance factor which is applicable to the companies at that point of time it has to be bought in and what we try here is that in financial statements the forming part thereof shall be the same which has been made all together and the requirements for the schedule shall stand modified successfully. So in case, let's say that when we are looking at Tata Motors, for example, suppose Tata Motors wants to make any sort of changes to their balance sheet because they have made some investment or they have made any kind of uh, changes right now because of some foreign country moving away from another uh, union or a system or you might see that there is a sudden change in the JV there is a sudden sale of asset or there's a you know sale of inventory that's happening all those kind of changes and amendments have to be bought into the system have to be bought into the methodology clearly which will actually help them to understand to identify and it has to be modified as per the section act told very very clearly 
the disclosure requirements specified in the schedule are addition and not for substitution of disclosure requirements specified in the accounting standards as prescribed in Companies Act of 2013. Now just look into the uh, factors very very clearly. This is something which can be added. It can be modified but it cannot be substituted. Please understand that in the place of A you cannot bring in statement B and say that this is equal. But yes you can go forward and add something more extra in order to bring in transparency. In order to bring in more ethical values in order to go forward and tell your investors that these are the changes that have been bought into. But at any given point of time substitution of one statement to another statement will not be allowed. That is what is very very important when we are talking about the statements. Now additional disclosures specified in the accounting standard shall be made in the notes of the account or by the way unless and until it is required. Now for example Tata Motors might have purchased a company or a manufacturing unit or might have gone in for a specific machinery or any kind of products in some other country. Now for that particular purpose they might have spent some extra money, they might have taken some money, they might have added on to the capital. So when you want to write these notes, when you want to make the people understand about those finer sections or finer modules altogether, your job is to see that you put that notes at the end of the balance sheet, put it there and then you have to say unless and until now for example this is only a disclosure methodology. This is not mandatory every time. Why are you making that disclosure in IFRS is in order to make transparency even more effective. Sometimes what it might happen is that when you miss out on these kind of statements, when you miss out on these kind of values altogether, there might be a question raised by the SEBI or by the company board saying that why have you not specified this to the investor. So disclosure is only an extra additional information that might not be mandatory every time but that is good on the part of the company to go forward and present it. Followed by similarly all other disclosures required by the company act has to be made to the notes of the account in addition to the requirements set out in the schedule. In addition to whatever that has been told if there has to be some additional factor in any other notes that needs to be added it has to be given there. So that's why I would say that this is very very important in terms of understanding the concept. Now moving forward. The balance sheet and the statement of profit and loss for a company. The first thing that we are starting is notes to the account shall contain information in addition that is presented in financial statement and shall be provided whenever required. So whenever you are giving the notes, whenever you are presenting the document, whatever you have done it in terms, these are all factors that has to be presented in a particular manner. It has to be told in that way that these are the additional factors, these are the additional statements that have been presented so that you are able to understand the phenomenon, you are able to understand the factors that are arising altogether. Now the narrative description or disengagement of system recognized in the statement for certain statements for certain subheadings it is mandatory that you have to give out the narrations which means to say that you might have given an extra long descriptive note altogether so that narrations that descriptions whatever that has been told has to be bought in has to be recognized as per the statement followed by information of items that do not qualify for recognition in the statement there might be certain items which will not be qualified as per the need as per the standard of IFRS or the Indian accounting standards those statements have to be bought in very very clearly telling the company why these are not coming into picture. Each item on the face of the balance sheet and statement of profit and loss shall be cross verified cross reference to any related information before preparing the balance sheet before preparing the financial statement including the notes and this has to be maintained. Now what do I mean by saying this is that for every company in this world whenever we are preparing the financial statement the balance sheet the profit and loss 
each and every item, each and every module, each and every heading has to be checked 10 times because whatever we are going to present through the balance sheet is going to be the image of the company. It's going to be the face value of the company because the public, the investors, the board, the exchange, everybody will be looking into the company's validity, trust and the ethical practices. So whenever you are presenting the balance sheet, you are presenting the lifeline of the company, you are telling to the people, this is based to the best of our knowledge presented. So that's why all these statements that are being made that are going to be presented have to be clear, concise and correct in nature. Followed by Let's talk about the general instructions for preparation of balance sheet. What are the general instructions that we need to understand? Now, when you are preparing the balance sheet, it is expected to be realized in or it is intended for sale or consumption in company's normal operating cycle. So no doubt about it, it's a normal operating cycle. It is held primarily for the purpose of being traded. So absolutely, yes, it is being held for the purpose of being traded factor. It is expected to be realized within 12 months after reporting the date or, you know, it is a factor that we have to understand. We have to make it very, very clear altogether. Followed by, it is cash or cash equivalent unless it is restricted from the exchange or used to settle a liability in 12 months. Now, you might have suddenly used the cash that is available in the reserve that's available with the company in order to settle a debt. Now, this was exactly that was happening in the case of Reliance Industry when they had gone ahead and made a statement saying that they had cleared all the debts. But then again, it was pointed out in business line stating that they are still remaining with about 15,000 odd crores. Now, when we are talking about certain debt clearance, cash equivalents or other factors, this has to be clearly emphasized and told to the people of the organization stating that where we have made that exchange, what are all the different factors under which it has been done and all other assets shall be classified as non-current. Why? Because whatever you are using on the current factors apart from this will be classified into the non-correct assets module altogether. An operating cycle which is between the acquisition of the assets processing realization of cash equivalent whereas normal operating cycle cannot be identified. It has to be assumed as 12 months. Now, why are we bringing this distinction is that when you are going to purchase an asset and put the asset into usage, so where I'm going to talk about the operating cycle in terms of acquisition here and the normal operating cycle, there is a difference. The normal operating cycle for a company will be for 12 months. We assume it for one year. But in the case, an operating cycle is between the acquisition of the assets for processing and their realization. So in the other way, around what happens is that the time gap between acquisition of the asset and realization is where the operating cycle has been defined. Now, moving forward, the next thing that we are seeing is that a liability factor, a liability shall be classified as a current when it satisfies the following criteria. First one, it is expected to be settled in company's normal operating profit cycle, normal cycle, which means to say that within that 12 months, that current liability should have been solved. So when I'm typically talking about an April to March or a March to April cycle, I have to finish up that particular liability. Followed by, it is primarily held for the purpose of being traded. It is due to be settled within 12 months after the reporting date or the company does not have any unconditional right to defer the statement of liability for at least 12 months. Now, if it's going for a deferment or if there are going to be any changes, the company does not have unconditional right. The company cannot take it for granted saying that, sir, yes, I will defer the payment. It has to give a 
time line. It has to give a conditional factor saying that the liability for at least 12 months after the reporting date, after the date, within that one year, I have to settle it. Terms of liability could be that an option for the counterparty results in settlement by the issue of equity instrument. All other liabilities other than what has been mentioned here shall be classified as non-current liabilities. So current liability means all the liabilities which will be solved by the organization in terms within that operating cycle only that is within 12 months. Followed by the general instructions for preparing the balance sheet. Fourth one, a receivable shall be classified as a trade receivable if it is in the respect of the amount due to the account of goods sold or services rendered in the normal course of business. So which is being done in the normal course in the normal track altogether. Fifth one, a payable shall be classified as trade payable if it is in respect of the amount due to the account of goods purchased for services or the action that is rendered in the normal course of business. Now, a company shall disclose the following notes to the company's account. So this becomes mandatory for all of us to go forward and start disclosing the acts of the company. Followed by the share capital which now comes into picture for each class of share capital what we are talking about. Now the number of amount of shares authorized, the number of shares issued, subscribed, par value per share, reconciliation of the number of outstanding shares, the rights, references, restrictions attached to it. Followed by shares respect in each class of the company held by its holding company. All these disclosures are mandatory. So you need to first of all tell the number and amount of the shares authorized. The number of shares that has been issued to the public and what is the par value? What is the reconciliation at the number in terms of shares outstanding? Rights, preferences, holding patterns, every single nomination has to be revealed by the company during the time of the final accounts to be prepared. So that's where the share capital comes into picture. Followed by the reserves and surplus. Now, how are the reserves and surplus coming into picture? We are going to talk about the capital reserves. We are going to talk about the capital redemption reserve, the securities premium, the uh, debenture now. Now, of course, the securities premium is omitted nowadays because it's updated. Now, debenture redemption reserve, revaluation. What is your revaluation reserve that's available? Your share options outstanding if there is anything that has been given and any other reserve specified under each and every category that has been told. So that's where all these reserves have to be classified and has to be exposed through the balance sheet saying that these are the amount of reserves that the company is holding at the time of the balance sheet. With this, I come to the end of this session. I hope and believe that this session was informative and of a great use to you. In the upcoming session, we will be seeing more about the consolidated financial statements and how they are bringing in a change to the company's accounting standards. Until then, stay tuned, stay blessed and stay enlightened forever. Thank you once again for joining me on this wonderful session today.